Well, good morning and happy Sunday to you, online family. Thanks for joining us once again. I always want to thank you for your faithfulness and your support, uh, especially in the area of your tithes and offerings. And we're going to go ahead and start in that area, exhorting you along those lines. So if you have your Bible, we'll open up today looking at uh, Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16, and I'll give you a moment to find that. And that's what we'll look at today. Okay, I believe you found it. And uh, let's begin at verse 10. Luke 16, verse 10. This is Jesus talking. He says, He who is faithful in a very little thing is faithful also in much. And he who is dishonest and unjust in a very little thing is dishonest and unjust also in much. We know that it's God's will to give us much, but God does an assessment over a protracted period of time to see if we can handle much. And the assessment that he does is he looks at and evaluates how we handle little. Verse 11, it says, Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the case of the unrighteous mammon, or deceitful riches, or money, or possessions. Now that, that's the little. Then he says, who will entrust to you the true riches? That's the much. So it's God's will to entrust to each and every one of us the true riches. But that becomes a reality after we have been proven faithful in that which is little or the least, talking about money. And it says, and if you have not been proved faithful in that which belongs to another, whether God or man, let's read that again. If you have not been, not have, uh, if you have not proved faithful in that which belongs to another, whether God or man. Now, the tithe belongs to God. Say that with me on the account, on the count of three. One, two, three. The tithe belongs to God. So a huge part of our, our evaluation that we're undergo prior to God entrusting us with the true riches is to see if we've been faithful in that which belongs to him. What belongs to God? Well, we just said it, the tithe. Amen. So you have an opportunity today to prove yourself faithful in the tithe. You have an opportunity to prove yourself faithful in that which belongs to God. Now, if you haven't been tithing, you can start today. You can start today by separating 10% of your income and bringing it in to the storehouse. The storehouse is a reference to your local church. When you do that, you're being faithful. You're obeying God with the tithe, and you're setting yourself up to be entrusted with the true riches. Now, the true riches are far better than money. Money can do some things, but the true riches, the true riches can take care of all of our needs. When I say all, I'm talking about number one, first and foremost, or most, more important, most importantly, our spiritual needs. Also, the needs of our, our soul, Amen. Uh, there's a lot of us who are hurting, but when we operate in faithfulness uh, with, that, with that which belongs to God, God can entrust us with the true riches. So true meaning is meaning full proof. When he describes the least or money, one of the descriptions that he uses is uncertain. Money is associated with uncertainty. God, God is always working for our certain good. But we don't receive that until we prove ourselves faithful in that which belongs to him. Amen. Now, if we go up, uh, for the sake of time, I don't want to read this entire passage, but let me just give you some background. And I'm sure most of you are familiar with the uh, analogy or the parable that precedes the verses that we just read. 
So I'll just give you a brief summation. Um, Jesus is using the analogy of a, of a uh, owner or a rich man who owns a business and the rich man or the owner uh, gets word that his manager or his steward is mismanaging or misappropriating his belongings. And of course, Jesus is saying this to the, to the disciples and this is a teaching point that he's using for us as well. And so in the analogy, he is Jesus or God. He's the one who's the owner and we are his managers. We are his stewards. A manager and a steward is not, uh, man they're not managing what belongs to them. They're managing what belongs to their boss. Amen. And so if you, uh, if you associate that with our finances, God sees the top 10% of our finances as his because it does belong to him. And he's looking at how we manage it. But a lot of us are misappropriating or squandering, that's the word used here, our, our father's or our master's goods. And in this, this particular passage of scripture, when the owner finds out that the, that the manager is mismanaging his goods, he fires him. And you know the Bible says that God will never leave us nor forsake us, but when we're robbing God of what belongs to him, it limits what he can do in our lives. So don't limit God by mismanaging what belongs to him. Return to God what belongs to him so that God can entrust to you the riches that are true. Amen. Now, verse 8, Jesus makes a very interesting statement, and it's really an indictment uh, with regard to his people. And verse 8 says, And this master praised the dishonest and unjust manager for acting shrewdly or prudently. Now those two words are just another, uh, you can interchange those two words with one word, and that is wisely or wisdom. He, then he goes on to say this, For the sons of this age, talking about those of the world, those who are unsaved, are shrewder and more prudent and wiser in relation to their own generation, to their own age and kind, then are the sons of light. We are the sons of light. So that, that's an indictment. And Jesus is, is virtually saying that the people in the world are much wiser with regard to how they use money. Now, especially those who are, are ruling the world, the, the ruling class, who are pretty much dictating how things on the earth run. You look at that ruling class, they use, they're, they're not consumers. They're people are, who are in control and they use their money, they use their money to push their agenda. They use their money uh, with, with, goal, with their goal in mind. Their master is the, the, the liturgy, the God of this world. Our master is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He also has an agenda. He also has a mission that he wants to accomplish. And there's, there's a financial component to that mission. Well, what is the mission that Jesus left or entrusted to the body of Christ? That mission is the Great Commission, which in detail says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Amen. That's the mission in summation. And so our finances, first and foremost, are to be used to that end. Just like the people in the world, the ruling class, they're, they're, they invest with regard to accomplishing a goal. So you and I, we need to be plugged into God and we need to be plugged into God's purposes and with regard to our finances. 
Now here's the thing about God. God, God let's, let's, let's turn over here to 1 Timothy chapter 6. And it really gives insight into the way God does things. 1 Timothy chapter 6, looking at verse 17, it says, And for as for the rich in this world, and again, Bible rich just means that you have more than enough. And God wants each and every one of us to have more than enough so that we can fulfill uh, our, our God-ordained assignment as a church, as the body of Christ. Charge them not to be proud and arrogant or contemptuous of others, nor to set their hopes on uncertain riches, but to set their hope on God. Now, look what God does. God richly and ceaselessly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. That's God's heart, but that becomes a reality when we embrace God's mission. When we embrace God's mission and support that mission financially. When we put God's mission and God's purpose first in the area of our finances, what does God do? He richly and ceaselessly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. That's how the kingdom of God works. You and I need to occupy ourselves financially with, with backing and supporting the kingdom of God, the kingdom agenda, the kingdom mission. When we do that, God, and see, it's, it's a part of God's nature. It's a part of who God is. He's our provider, Jehovah Jireh. God sees to it that we always have provision. The Bible says that he gives seed to the sower and bread to those who eat. Amen. So we have an opportunity right now to, number one, return to God what belongs to him. When we tithe, we're proving ourselves faithful in that which is least. Now, we go beyond the tithe into giving offerings. We have general offerings, and then we have offerings that we sow into the life of our teacher according to Galatians chapter 6. And then you'll see that all throughout the book of Philippians, namely Philippians chapter 1 and Philippians chapter 4. On Sunday, our, our pastor issues what he calls the favorite challenge every Sunday. And then I do that on his behalf on, on our online service every Sunday. So I challenge 50 people, it's not limited to 50 people, to sow $50 over and above your regular tithes and offerings in expectation of God showing you favor as a result of you doing over and above. Amen. So as, as we do this on a weekly basis, as we have the mindset, and see the mindset that you and I need to adopt uh, more than ever in these last days is a kingdom mindset, an investment mindset, meaning that I know that when I invest in the kingdom of God, God will step in and provide me with everything for my enjoyment. Amen. So let's, let's, let's remember we're, we're finishing out this year, 2022, being faithful in the area of our giving. So let's embrace that wholeheartedly <clears throat> and let's follow up through our actions today. So I exhort you, I admonish you, I encourage you, and I challenge you to return the tithe into the storehouse. Give God what belongs to him so that you're proven faithful and God can entrust to you the true riches. If there's ever a need, if there's ever, ever, ever been an area of need, uh, in these last days, we need riches that are true. Amen. The economy, this world, is becoming increasingly unstable and God wants us to plug into him. God wants, us, God wants to be our provider. And we need his provision in these last days. But if that's going to be a reality in our lives, we have to be people who are kingdom-minded. We have to be people who are willing to invest, first and foremost, into the kingdom. Amen? So having said that, I want to thank you for your, your continued support and remind you of the two options that we made available to you, our online family. Family. First option is 
online. You can go to vinelifechristianfellowship.com and do your giving online. If you haven't been to the website, the instructions are very simple. Now, for those of you who want to choose the mail option, at the bottom of your screen, you'll see the address to the ministry, and you can mail in your tithes, your offerings, and your partnership, uh, as well as your favorite seat. Amen? Re remember, we have to be people who have the mindset to put the kingdom first in these last days. Amen. And God, who, God who is our provider, will ceaselessly and richly provide us with everything for our enjoyment. Amen. So let's go ahead and get into the message for today. And uh, doing a very important and timely message. <clears throat> and uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We'll begin there. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and we'll begin there. We'll, we'll start off with our confession of faith. So let's lift up, lift up your Bible. If you have a leather-bound Bible, lift that up. If you have the Bible downloaded to a device like I do, lift that up, and we'll make our confession of faith. Repeat after me. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. I have what it says I have. I'm a believer, not a doubter. I'm a doer, not just a hearer. And my life is the better after having heard the word of faith. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now, if we want to bottom line what we've been teaching as of late, the word that we would, the word that we would use that would be most appropriate would be the word devotion. The word devotion. Amen. And <clears throat> we're applying devotion in three specific areas um, for the rest of this year. And of course, the, the ultimate goal is to apply diligence and sincerity for the rest of our lives. But we have a short-term goal. You know, uh, if you want to reach your goal, your ultimate goal, you want to implement and carry out short-term goals. And so our short-term goal is to maintain diligence and, and sincerity in, um, number one, seeking God at our house. Number two, um, being faithful in the assembly, and then number three, being faithful in our giving. So that word devotion, uh, and it's a key word because devotion, when we're devoted to God, we're cooperating with him, we're, we're putting ourselves in agreement, and we're cooperating with God in the development of our faith, the development of our faith. The Bible says that the just shall live by faith. So, at the center of the Christian life, as a believer, at the center of our lives is faith. That is our connection to God. Amen. Without faith, it is impossible to please God, for he that cometh to God. And that's, that's what God wants us to do. God wants, to come, wants us to come to him in fellowship. That should be the centerpiece of our life. That should be our central focus, is to come to God in fellowship. And when we do that, we're positioning ourselves uh, in, 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 in a way where Jesus, who is the author and the finisher, the Amplified says the developer of our faith, we position ourselves for Jesus to do just that, develop our faith. So our faith being our connection to God needs to be developed. So, what, what conclusion can we draw from that? As a believer, a huge part of our life is the development of our faith. That doesn't take place without us applying diligence and sincerity to the area of devotion. Amen. Romans 12 says, I beseech you, brother, by the mercies of God, to present your body a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice. So, again, what is a living sacrifice? To me, that sounds like a person who is devoted to fellowshipping with God. A person who understands that their faith needs to be developed. And if their faith is going to be developed, 
Amen. That requires them to be devoted. Amen. So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 35. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 35. The Apostle Paul says, Now I say this for your own welfare and profit. Let's read that, that, that first statement here. Now I say this for your own welfare and profit, not to put a halter or restraint upon you, but to promote what is seemly and, and in good order and to secure your undistracted and undivided devotion to the Lord. So the Apostle Paul was saying this to the Corinthian church. And the goal that he had in mind was to secure their undistracted and undivided devotion to the Lord for the purpose of the development of their faith. That's the primary purpose. Remember, without faith it is impossible to please God. He that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who do what? Diligently seek him. Diligently seek him. The Bible says that you and I need to keep our eyes on Jesus and look away from all that will distract. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus and look away from all that will distract. Why? Because Jesus, he's the author and the finisher or the developer of our faith. Now, going back up to the beginning of the verse, uh, examining that, that first statement, he says, now I say this for your own welfare and profit, not to put a halter or restraint upon you. The reason he's saying that is because when we hear the word devotion, especially if we hear it from a carnal perspective, what, what comes in the mind is that God is trying to restrain me because devotion uh, suggests time. It suggests the spending of time. Amen. And we live in a world where devotion to the Lord is not promoted. Outside of the church, devotion to the Lord is not promoted. And so we live in this world that is constantly telling us to seek other things, and we've all been affected by that. So when we get saved and God, God says, hey, uh, I want a greater level of devotion from you, we tend to we tend to associate that, that call of God when God is drawing you to himself. We have a tendency to, to associate that with being restrained. But the way the Apostle Paul learned to see it is that devotion is not associated with restraint. But in his mind, as a result of the Holy Spirit teaching him and dealing with him, he learned to associate devotion to the Lord with his own welfare and profit. Now, the Apostle Paul, out of his own experience, is conveying that message via letter to the, to the Corinthian church. So you and, you and I, and this is not something that we can do in our own effort. This is something that the Holy Spirit will teach us. This is something that the Holy Spirit he will share his mindset with regard to devotion to you and I as we apply devotion. We'll begin to, to associate devotion with welfare and profit. Amen. Now let's look at um, 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. What the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter had in common is that there were two men who lived their life in devotion to the Lord, and that devotion is, is evidenced in their writing. You'll see similarities. So 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, beginning at verse 6, it says, You should be exceedingly glad on this account, though now for a little while you may be distressed by trials and suffer temptations. This scripture here reminds me of what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 5, verses, uh, in particular, verses 1 through 5, uh, even more specifically, verse 3. We won't look at that, but we've looked at that um, in times, you know, in previous teachings quite extensively. 
So again, Peter says, you should be exceedingly glad on this account, though now for a little while you may be distressed by trials and suffer temptations. Now, he mentions distress, he mentions trials and temptations in the context of being exceedingly glad. Now, when you're in, in times of distress, uh, when you're going through a trial, when you're suffering temptation, the natural association isn't one of gladness. But how many of you know we're not called to live uh, by our, our, in the natural? We're called to live by faith and not by sight. Sight is a, is a reference to the natural. And so even though uh, gladness, distress, and trials, temptations, are, we don't make that natural association. The Holy Spirit will do just that. He'll, he'll help us have the proper association so that when times are hard, we learn how to associate that with gladness. Because underneath the surface, God has a plan. God is doing something during those times of hardship, during those times of trial, during those times of temptation, God is working in us. And when God is working in us, he's one who knows how to finish his work. Amen. God is one who knows how to finish or complete or perfect his work. Glory to God. Now let's go on to... Uh, Verse 7. In verse 6, it tells us what we should do in times or the attitude we should have in times of distress, trial, and temptation. We should be exceedingly glad. Now, verse 7 gets into the reason why he's telling us that. Why is he telling us to be exceedingly glad when faced with times of, of, of distress and trial? and temptation. Why should we be exceedingly glad? This is why. So that the genuineness of your faith may be tested. Remember, faith is our connection to God. It's the centerpiece of our relationship with God. But faith, if you understand faith, faith is something that needs to be perfected. Faith is something that needs to be developed. So the life of faith requires devotion, undistracted devotion. Now, if you think about uh, a time, and you, this might be your current set of circumstances, you might be in a time of great distress. You might be in a time of great trial. You might be in a time of great temptation. But we need to know that those conditions are necessary for the, develop, the, the, for the development of our faith. Faith, by definition, there's really two definitions. There's a definition of faith, and there's a definition of faith in God. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So when you look at um, the evidence of things hoped for, that word hope, suggest that what you believe in for or what you desire has not materialized. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So when you're faced with a trial, you're, you're faced with a distressing circumstance, you're in a circumstance that you don't want to be in that because it's, it's causing you distress. So you don't, you haven't seen, see, Trials, temptations, tests, we want to be delivered out of those situations. And God delivers us out of all of our trials. The Bible says uh, that God delivers us out of all of our trials, right? But when you're in that trial, that's when you need faith. And since that, that those circumstances necessitate faith, 
those are the those are the, the the conditions in which God uses to develop our faith. Those are the conditions in which God uses to develop our hope, our confident and joyful expectation in Him. Now, the definition of faith in God, which is faith's ultimate goal, that definition is us leaning our entire human personality on God in absolute trust and confidence in his goodness, his wisdom, and his power. That is that that materializes, it becomes evident in our life through the avenue of devotion. Because when we're when we're co when we're devoting ourselves to the Lord, we're cooperating with him in the development of our faith. Now, if you have a King James Version, I like to read verse 6 out of that version because it makes things a little more clear. Amplified Version, you know, was developed to, to bring clarity, you know, that's why it's, it's called the Amplify, but certain verses are more clear you know, and God wants to speak to you and will speak to you out of certain verses and make it clear out of the King James or other versions. So let's look at verse 6 out of the King James. It says, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season. Now he makes this interesting statement here. If need be, if need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. Now. This is what the Holy Spirit has been dealing with, <clears throat> dealing with me personally to really give me an understanding of what he does in, 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 in hard times. It says, if need be. Now, you know, since I, 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 I've been an athlete all my life, um, I don't go to the gym like I used to, get a little older. I need, I need to be more devoted to the gym. But this is what I see in this verse. And as I'm talking, I want you to be thinking about the development of your faith. Well, development. Development necessitates heaviness or weight. So imagine we're in the gym. You go out to the, you go, you, you enter the gym and there you'll find a whole bunch of weights. The reason there's weights in the gym, you guessed it, is for development. Muscle growth or muscle development. If you take the weights out of the gym, the gym no longer serves its intended purpose. So when we're in times of trial and tests and temptations, God sees a gym. He sees conditions that will, will necessitate or aid him in the development of our faith. So when you're in a trial, when you're, you're, when you're in a, a test, when you uh, are being tempted, you have to see gladness, rejoicing, triumphing, exalting. You have to see those things as resistance. You have to see those things as, just like you see, uh, you have a weight and you're, you're using that weight for development. So when I praise and thank God in times of trials and tests and temptations, it's like me lifting weights because I'm resisting the weight of the trial. I'm pushing against the weight of the temptation. Amen. I'm resisting the weight of the trial. And in my resistance, development is taking place. We have to start seeing praise in the midst of hard times, just like we see weights in the gym. Just like we see what, what lifting weights does. It has that very same effect. So we're running out of time. So let me encourage you. Those of you 
who are in hard times. God has got you a gym membership, and the reason God has got you a gym membership is so that you can go in the gym and start lifting weights. God has you in a place where he's not looking to crush you. God has you in a place where you can press against the problems with praise. You can, you can resist the weight of temptation with praise. And, and God is your spotter. When things start to get too heavy for you to lift, when you open your mouth in thanksgiving, when you open your mouth in praise, it's just like you saying, hey God, hey Jesus, spot me, and he will. He'll help you lift that weight. And see, it's when you need a spotter. It's when the weight is so heavy that you need help. That's, that's when the, 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 the most development is taking place. When, when it's too heavy for you to lift yourself, that's the, that's the greatest conditions. Under those conditions, the greatest development is made. The greatest progress is made. So I'm telling you, if, if, if things are heavier than they've ever been, look, look to be stronger than you've ever been. Amen? Well, I believe the Spirit of God spoke to us today, so let's give him all the glory and all the praise and all the honor. I want to thank you again, family, for tuning in and for supporting us. We have a three-day meeting this, this week, and it's not like, it's, it's not the same days we've been meeting. This upcoming week we're going to be meeting Wednesday night at 7, Thursday night at 7, and Friday night at 7. We see the day approaching. So what we're doing in correspondence with that is we're meeting all the more faithfully. So all of you are online family. I extend an invitation to you. That invitation is always open. Every time we have additional meetings, you're invited. Amen. So come, obey, obey what it says in Hebrews 10 to 25. Assemble yourself together with other believers. Amen. So having said that, God bless you and enjoy the rest of your day. For more information on Vine Life Christian Fellowship, please visit our website at www.vinelifechristianfellowship.com. Options concerning the tithe, offerings, partnership, or favor challenge are located in the description box below. It is our hope that you have been blessed and enlightened by this message. As we begin our online journey, we encourage you to subscribe to this channel, ensuring that you will not miss future messages. On behalf of Vine Life Christian Fellowship, we would like to thank you for joining us. Have a blessed day, and we will see you next time.